Salve, citizens. Today, we will be discussing the new novel, Darkness in the Blood, by Guy Haley. Now, I brought the special edition version, which I'll show you in a moment, but the reason I say this is not to show off and gloat. Of course not, never. It's because it means it isn't going to be out on a general release for some time. I'm guessing around September 2020, give or take a month or maybe more, as we are currently in the midst of the plague as I record this. So, not only will I be going through spoilers for this book, like normal, but these are advanced spoilers. So if you don't want to know what's been going on with Dante and the lads from Baal, now's the time to turn off and go away. Right, now all those losers have gone. Let's get into this. So, here is the box. Now, it's a beautiful set, as you can see. It comes in a sort of cardboard box type thing. It isn't wood, unfortunately. We get the little postcard in, as you saw there. We've got this amazing, amazing diary. Um, it's too good to use, <laughs> frankly. But it's full of nice little features. You can see every pa every couple of pages there's a little quote. It's got blood spatter on it. Beautiful. Too good to use, though. Why would I, you know, I use post-it notes if I need them at all. The book itself, yeah, it's a bit of a pain to get out. Oh, what's that on the back? Oh. Oh. I think I had an apple. <laughs> so here we see the book itself. Beautiful piece of artwork there. This is leather, or fake leather probably. But you can see all of the lettering and every, all of the uh, everything is embossed, basically. Um, you can see there, it's, it's a beautiful book, signed by Mr. Haley himself there. And yeah, gold paging throughout. Beautiful. You also get this uh, little set of dice. Now, these are uh, beautiful things. Uh, special made Blood Angels dice there. Comes in a little baggie. We've also got this, which I think is some kind of measuring thing or ruler. I, I, I don't fully understand what this is. <laughs> but it's gold and metal. Uh, we've got an hourglass where I can count down the uh, moments of my life I've wasted reading Warhammer stuff. And uh, we've got a nice little badge here. A Dante badge, which I'll never wear in public. <laughs> we've got a beautiful coin. Um, yeah, uh, from the chaplain. I forgot what the, uh, I forgot what his name is. Is it Lysander? I can't remember his name. Uh, we've got a beautiful uh, coin for the. Uh, oh God, I forgot his name as well. Because that isn't Mephiston. This is the thing that struck me, and this is a pain to get out. I forgot it. Yeah, there we go. Dante himself. Beautiful. These are really nice coins. Beautiful coins. But there's no Mephiston, which seems like an oversight. But anyway, yeah. Here's the box itself, it's beautiful, it looks scruffy now, it's been on my shelf for a couple of months, because I haven't read this quickly enough. Yeah, uh, it's a nice, nice set. So, I'm sure you'll agree that that is impressive. Now, I've never bought one of those books, one of these special edition sets before, so I was impressed with the quality of it, but whether I buy one again, I'm not 100%. If you're a big time collector, I'm not generally... Like, I sell my books if I need the cash, you know. I've got a couple that I've not kept around, but they're just like, I don't know, they're just, uh, like, for instance, I've got the first, the uh, the Gaunt's Ghost first book that I've had since it came out on release day. I won it in a painting competition at my local games workshop. And uh, I've had it ever since, and it was one of the first books I ever read. In fact, I think it was probably the first book I ever read, if my memory serves, and started me down this horrible path that we're all stuck in to one extent or another. Anyway, let's crack on. So, before I delve in again, I will be spoiling this book and uh, attempting to give an in-depth review of what's occurring within its shiny gold pages, with as few tangents and rambling, ranting detours as I can, which is going to be difficult. First, let's cover the basic story, and I will delve deeper into different parts afterwards. Before we delve into the actual book... Guy Haley has a foreword, basically saying that now we know exactly what's going on, even though they clearly don't, and uh, we have to plan in advance and stuff. Now, I think it's fair what he's saying there. They probably do have a, a good idea of what's to come, but how it actually looks at the end seems off. And I think it's quite clear that there might be some communication um, particularly between the authors, some communication. But there seems to be a disconnect between the authors and the, the sort of law development team, the game design team side of things, 
which I would like to see addressed because it affects the it affects how the books come out, you know. And it's nothing on the authors themselves. They're doing their best and they're doing a really good job of making some rather silly choices make sense. But uh, yeah, we've got to talk about that, all that in a bit. <laughs> this book is set shortly after the devastation of Baal. And if you haven't read that yet, you aren't going to have a clue about this. Baal is in the process of being transformed into the seat of governance for the Imperium Nihilus, that half of the Imperium separated from Terra by the Great Rift. Dante is now the Imperial Regent of it, on the orders of Primarch Gilman himself. To that end, with all the resources and authority gifted him, he has started to reunify and secure the territories around Baal, whilst also building up a massive force to hold this, expand this secure Imperial territory, and to strike at the Tyranids in particular that are still reeling and disorientated from the events following the devastation of Baal. One of the things I was disappointed about in this was the lack of Seth, as the conversation between him and Dante at the end of the previous novel was fascinating and raised hopes in me that we would get a lot of discussion about the conflict between the Primaris and the Old Marines, or I should say the Innovators and this new reforming movement, I guess you would say, which is a big deal, which is something that, and, you know, I don't want to go on about it, but it's something that hasn't really been covered, and it ignores a lot of the rules of the universe that this stuff hasn't been discussed. And also just the fact that Primaris are replacing traditional traditional marines, and it causes a lot of problems in the law which aren't addressed and are simply brushed over. It seems we aren't going to get that, and they are just going to forget about it until all existing named characters are Primarisified, and GW stops selling normal marines. But that's a whole conversation I'm not going to get into, really, because it's boring to me now. But I only mention it so I don't have to go into it when we get to the Mephiston situation later. But I blatantly still will. So yeah, no Seth, and to be honest, no other major Blood Angels characters other than Dante, Mephiston, and Reculus, and some brief asides from other Blood Angels known characters. This is a tad disappointing again, as Devastation had so many amazing characters, and we are mostly just with Dante and Mephiston a bit, and some Navy officers throughout the whole novel. Now, the book starts with a battle on a stairway, where a governor's guard are fighting to the death, waiting for extraction for uh, the governor's son, in the midst of a gene stealer revolt. It's a nice scene, good fighting, I did enjoy it. Uh, the governor's son gets out and will eventually get to Baal and ask for Dante's help on his world. But that's towards the end, and it feels like a B story he put in after the fact to justify the battle at the end, when he realised not much happens other than cool characters have a bit of a chat. Not knocking the book, it's good, but this is the TLDR of this book. So Dante, in the aftermath of the devastation of Baal and his promotion to regent, in an effort to bolster his building armies, rescues a damaged Imperial fleet under Admiral Danakan and his second-in-command, Flag Lieutenant Juvenal, and begins to escort them through the warp. Now, the warp is messed up all over the galaxy now because of, you know, the giant tear in reality cutting the galaxy in two. And it's even worse on the Baal side of things because they have trouble seeing the Astronomicon now, and they have to rely on Mephiston and the Space Marine librarians to guide the ships. Now, how they do this is that there is uh, manifestations of the emerging entities, or greater demons, I suppose, representing the collective belief in Sanguinius and the Blood Angels and their successors as a whole, contained in the being known as the Sanguinor, and also the Dark Side of their characters and spirits, and that shadow in their souls, of all those of the uh, blood of Sanguinius, and I guess from the collective agonies of them and their victims, which manifests in the form of the Black Knight. This is shown to us as two entities, dueling and warring in the warp as two godlike figures, smashing their blades against each other continuously, but they seem to be acting as guides to Mephiston and the Blood Angels librarians, 
leading them through the warp storms to Baal. The other ships in the fleet have their navigators following the Blood Angel ships, but their navigators are losing it slowly and only travelling because they can follow them. It's difficult, though, and Admiral Danakan's flagship has to drop out of the warp under Chaos Assault after a super-harsh scene where we see navigators trying to navigate with basically cattle bolts behind their heads in case they succumb to corruption. Harsh, but also fun. The flagship of the Imperials is caught in a warp anomaly which disrupts time and its crew are being eaten by demons. Dante and Mephiston head over there with a force of Primaris and old marines. When they get there, it's like a week later. The crew are all dead, but it's like in the future, kind of. Warp fuckery. Anyways, eventually they come upon Slaneshi demons. And i got to say... I like Guy Haley's demon stuff. He does a good job, as you see here. Um. <clears throat> Vapors drawn from the demonette streamed into the greater demon. Blood flowing from the column nourished it. It swelled, its muscles filling out, its body gaining mass and solidity, becoming more real with every passing second. All the while, the fury of the blood angels battered against its psychic shields. As it approached, blood sank away into flesh, revealing skin the colour of pale roses. Its filthy loincloth, its filthy loincloth, unstuck from its legs and fluttered clean with a waft of lavender scent. <laughs> the rings piercing the, be the beast's flesh flashed with sudden brilliance, and it was so Free of blood, its tattooed skin revealed, its pierced breasts uncovered of gore, its manicured nails perfect. Fresh lacquer gleamed on lobster claws in exquisite, maddening patterns. The music reached a climax and celebrated by a chorus of screams. Kyrus came to a halt and bowed low in a complicated fashion, pushing out beautiful pushing one beautiful leg out and dropping low on the other, its four arms spread wide, fingers gyrating to conduct the applause of its servants as he brought it dance to an end. Still, the space marines fired on their weapons next to you. Ah, glorious. Now, that's all fun stuff, but the big event here is Mephiston loses it. He has been a borderline dangerous psyker for a while, after the events in Devastation of Baal, and I think things that happen in his own novel series, which I haven't read, and how much he has been using his uh, psychic powers has pushed him along, especially with recently trying to guide the ship. He breaks, and creates more warp fuckery, which creates a sanguineous flavoured warp tempest, which banishes the Slanesh sex cow, but also has the effect of unlocking the Black Rage in the Blood Angels Primaris. Now this is major. The first instance where we have seen that the flaws of a chapter truly manifest in the Primaris boys. Now Guy kind of gives himself room with this by saying it isn't a genetic flaw, but a psychic or spiritual flaw linked to the sorrow of Sanguinius, so Call's work can't stop it, even if it isn't as common for Primaris as it normally would be for regular Marines. This feels like a cop-out, and again, I get annoyed talking Primaris issues now, and I sympathise with the Black Library authors being stuck with this whole problem and trying to make sense of it. This is a decent attempt, but still, this whole thing is a mess, and I welcome the point, no one talks about them as new anymore, because we can just pretend the Primaris project didn't happen, and Marines are just Marines again, but taller. So from here we get some more time with Admiral Danakan and his lieutenant, as they purge the ship fully and let him to recrew it so it can be salvaged. Dante can see he is broken, and I think this is pretty well done, displaying his PTSD 
and how he isn't coping with recent events and is tired of war, particularly after he froze up in a previous battle when watching his whole bridge crew burn to death. The man is broken and a mess, and I sympathise with the man. But Dante needs him to act as a leader, as part of his efforts of reconquest, and as a rallying point for the Imperial fleet, which he is going to have to command now he is regent. They have a number of meals together, and some nice conversations covering Dante's own life, with flashbacks throughout the book, where he talks of necessity, sacrifice and courage, trying to rebuild the man's confidence and nerve by talking about the trials of his own life. This is good stuff, and eventually we hear about the battle in which Dante is the last remaining captain in the chapter, and is promoted to chapter master as a result. Good lore, good development, pretty awesome battle scenes. Also after this, Mephiston is out of action, and the other librarians are shitting bricks, using their powers and all that stuff to keep the comatose but psychically unstable Lord of Death under control. Eventually, they get back to Baal, where Quo 87 has turned up. Now, if you haven't read the great work, also by Guy Haley, you won't understand the Quo thing, not in the way it's intended. This is also great, as it links these novels together, and is the benefit of having one writer with a plan. Writing these multiple strands of events, because Guy does have a plan, and his own logic to the decisions his characters make. So this is Quo 87. So we can safely put this in a rough timeline of events and say that it actually happens before the Great Work and probably during or before the events in Plague War. Quo 87 is also the clone Call uses most of the time in the Great Work. Anyways, he and Dante have the following conversation which is quite enlightening on Call and Dante's feelings towards him and the Primaris and Rubicon procedure. Why are you here? You have many heroes amongst your kind, do you not? Indubitably, said Dante. All of the warriors of the blood are heroes. Some are the greatest heroes in the galaxy. Quo looked at Dante sympathetically. Some of them are growing old. My master has delivered unto the chapters of the Adeptus Astartes the salvation of mankind. The Primaris Marines are bigger, stronger, and superior in every way to the Principia. Principia? My master's term for the original kind of space marine. Personally, I would have used the term Tertium for your sort. There were two others before your kind was made. The Thunder Warriors of Old Terror and the Adeptus Custodes. I would have labelled these Principia and Seconda. A dozen tiny limbs spread on Quo's torso, in an insectile shrug. In his great wisdom, Belisarius Call opines that the Thunder Warriors were prototypes to both the Space Marines and the Guardians of the Throne. Furthermore, he told me that the Adeptus Custodes are of another line of research altogether, related but distinct, bespoke pieces to your masterful, mass-produced gene-forging. I know nothing of this. I know nothing of these Thunder Warriors. I am Adeptus Astartes. Our new brothers are Adeptus Astartes. That is all I need to know. You speak from a position of ignorance, said Quo gently. So much knowledge has been lost. So much that what I am going to say now, you must take on trust, because I have this knowledge and you do not. Quo paused a moment, to watch an enormous cannon be guided into its place, on the battle barge's spine, by a hundred tiny ships. The vibration, when it locked home, shook the walkway. Call it respects the experience and wisdom of the older sort of space marine. He has therefore devised a way to elevate your kind to the status of the new. Dante frowned at Quo. Turn my kind into Primaris marines. Exactly. I take it this procedure has been undertaken before. Many times now. Manius Calgar of the Ultramarines was the first, along with members of his honour guard. I understand some have taken to calling it the Calgar Procedure, misleading. If it must be named for a person, 
then surely it should be named for Archmagus Dominus Belisarius Call, prime conduit of... Was it successful? Dante interrupted. I would have heard of Calgar's death, I think, even with the current difficulties. Lord Calgar survived. Only two of his guard made it through the process. Then it is not a guaranteed success. No, my lord, though we have improved the procedure greatly since then, so much that I suspect in time it will become a matter of course. We are confident that our understanding of how to upgrade existing stock space marines into Primaris marines is advancing enough that we can pass the knowledge on to the apothecaries of each chapter. Just to stop there, I don't know if that's like a ridiculous meta comment. <laughs> as Ailey as as stuck some uh, fourth wall breaking wink and a nod to us, maybe. They have the relevant skills and training to make it a success. That is why I am here. What of before? Either I or one of Archmagus Call's other servants travelled to the chapter in question to perform the surgery. To be frank with you, I am glad that we are ready to pass this knowledge on. I am ready for a new challenge. Then you have done it before. Many times. But I do not wish for you to be complacent. There are certain idiosyncrasies to each of the gene lines of the Space Marines. The root stock of the line of the Primarch Sanguinius is more divergent than most. In fact, it is the most divergent of all the remaining loyal gene lines, except that of the Space Wolves. But they're another matter altogether. There are more extreme variations, but those are mutations, not intended. Your gene seed is the way it is because it was designed to be so, he smiled. The procedure is especially difficult with your type. Of course, you are as hardy of body and mind as the rest, but there are delicate matters that complicate the issue and bring the margins for success uncomfortably low. Excellent, excellent chapter there. That is a paragraph there. Says so much in one paragraph. Amazing. You know, what is it that they were intended to be so? Really? The Space Wolves? Really? <laughs> Great stuff. You mean the curse of my line, said Dante abruptly. There is a further matter I would raise. It has been suggested Call had attempted to repair the damage done to our gene seed by the passing ages. Let me tell you, he has singularly failed. I am aware of this, said Quo softly. Then why should I put my faith in what you say? The Archmagus's attempts to repair the damage to your gene seed could not be successful, said Quo, because we were made this way. Your propensity for savagery was engineered into your original legion, said Quo. All the flaw does is exacerbate what is already there. Quo suspects the affliction is spiritual rather than physical, but he did think he could ameliorate the condition. That is why the Rubicon Primaris is dangerous for you to cross. You refer to this Calgar procedure. Archmagus Dominus Belisarius Call calls it the Rubicon Primaris. I am not familiar with the word Rubicon either, said Dante. You shame me for my ignorance again. I expect few, but Call himself know this word. It is the name of a river a reference to an event from the most ancient of times, the dawn of human history, he told me. The Emperor reconstructed much of Terra's ancient past during the period of the Great Crusade. These histories were lost, as so much else was after the Great Heresy War. But Kor remembers, somehow. Quo smiled to himself. Somewhere in those great memory banks of his, it is all there, Quo shrugged if he had but the time to remember. You digress, the Rubicon. Yes, yes, I apologise. Call made me with the habit of meandering. It gives more of an illusion of personality, I suppose. There was, on ancient terror, before even the first millennium had run its course, an empire. This was the great realm of the Rumani, which ruled all the lands between the Middle Sea, the blue heart of the ancient world. The Romani had an emperor, as we have an emperor, Julius Caesari, the most powerful man in the world. There was a river, it is said, that Caesari had to cross to win the empire. Crossing the river was a gamble, because once crossed he would be committed to rebellion. He would either win or he would lose. 
what he could not do was go back. The name of that river was the Rubicon. It became a byword for irreversible decisions for many ages, though it is forgotten by all but Belisarius' call. And you? I remember it now, but I will no longer remember it when it is of no use to me. I am a limited creature, Lord Dante, not truly alive. I know this information at this moment because I must in order to convince you to do what is right. The memory storage required for this anecdote will be repurposed when it has served its purpose. Then you are not a man. Dante reappraised his guest. Quo smiled apologetically. Strictly speaking, I am not. Part of me was once a man, a very long time ago. Cole tried to save that man. He could not. The fields, boys. The fields. I am a facsimile of that man. A servitor, of sorts. I can never be regarded as human. I am an echo of something lost, like this imperium of ours. He chuckled. All human endeavour becomes an echo of itself, in the end. Palaces to piles of ruin, impressions in the sand to be swept away by the next strong wind. You think, you speak, you have agency, you are no servitor. The term does not fit me truly, agreed Quo. I am more than a servitor, less than a man. He sighed contentedly. Enough of one to appreciate the beauty of this view, and the artifice on display. Not enough to really understand it. I have no soul. There are laws in the cult mechanicus against such things as you, are there not? Quo laughed. It was a pleasant musical sound of amusement, and Dante felt a chill at its perfection. Knowing all of it, the mirth it stemmed from, the sound, the smile that accompanied it, to be wholly artificial, filthy AI. Of course there are, but I fall just close enough to the rules to give Archmagus Dominus Belisarius Corps room to manoeuvre around the law, if the need arises. Again, Guy Haley's playing with us, man. He's playing with us. He even said it's the law. It's L O. R.E., not law, L-A-W. My lord, call, has never played by the rules, Lord Dante, and if that gives you misgivings, I ask that you abandon them. The Archmagus has saved your chapter, and he might yet save all humanity. If I decline this knowledge, then I shall depart, said Quo. I would not hold it against you. The reason call calls this procedure the Rubicon Primaris is because of the risk, as with our ancient emperor, there is no return from the other side once you start across. Success brings rejuvenation, elevation to a new level of ability and the benefits of cause improvements to the emperor's design. Failure results in death, always. What is the success rate? said Dante. Sixty percent, give or take. For your chapter, the number is lower. Quo patted Dante's arm with a metal hand. I sympathize with you as much as I am able. He scrutinised the lines of Dante's face carefully. The first space marines were superior beings to those of the current era. Genetic deterioration has corrupted the Emperor's work. The warriors of the legions were functionally immortal, you know. They did not age in the same way you have. You have my pity. That is an amazing... I've never seen that before. I've, I've, I remember reading things similar, sim hinted, but I've never seen it said categorically like this. That's one of the reasons why the Chaos Space Marines are still alive. You know, um, <laughs> you know, it's a contributing factor. It's not just because they're in, you know, warp nightmare realm. And uh, oh, yeah, it's that. That's an amazing thing to say. That's canon now. Oh, amazing. I require no man's pity, said Dante coldly. Quo withdrew his hand. There is more than age that troubles you. His eyes strayed down to Dante's chest, as if he could see the wounds he bore. Dante took a step back. I shall leave you to consider this information. It could bring many benefits to you. It must be discussed before the chapter council. Ah, but I will leave it there. An amazing conversation, I'm sure you will agree. And there is more of it. I, I just thought that was the most pertinent part to this review. So it goes before the council. And we see some interactions between the old marines and the primaris. 
it goes some way to showing how they interact and touches on some of the issues, which is what happens throughout this book, to be honest. It touches on things, but it doesn't go deep, deep. Now, anyways, what's decided in the end is Dante is too valuable to lose, so they decide to test the Rubicon on Mephiston instead. Now, I've got issues with this. The rationale is, well, he's fucked anyways, and it might work and save him, allowing him to control his power in a new body, for some reason. I don't see how this would matter. It's a psychic affliction. What difference would it make how tall and powerful he is? And also, it is a bit dangerous to perform this procedure on an unstable, uber-powerful psyker. Anyways, they do. I guess the Primaris are supposed to have some innate resistance to the lure of chaos, but I don't see how that could be possible. But then again, maybe it is. I mean, Fabius Ball managed it on his little uh, experimental projects. Now again, I don't want to harp on about the Primaris thing, because I already have, so I'll make this as brief as possible, and again say the authors, such as Guy here, are doing their best to make a shit show palatable. It still tastes like shit, but you will at least have a bite of it before you throw up. I am an expert at analogies. So, two things happen to Mephiston now. He becomes joined to a psychic manifestation of the Black Rage, or the collection, or the collected beliefs, I should say, in Sanguinius in the Warp, which is represented by the Black Knight. I'll discuss the Warp fuckery more shortly. Firstly, let's talk Primaris. Oh, the joy. Once I've gone through this Primaris Rubicon thing... I'm never going to discuss it again because I'm bored shitless with the whole thing now and I've said my piece on it many times. And too many times, I'm sure you will agree. So what GW wants to do is make Primaris Marines the new Marines or the standard, etc. Various reasons for this uh, that I'm not going to get into. They also want to have the named characters that are old Marines turned into Primaris because that makes sense. To do this... They could have just said, yeah, it's just a procedure, the Marines get upgraded, etc., boom, done. You, me, everyone would still complain about it, but compared to the way they have done it, it is a way less annoying and troublesome way of doing it. Plus, it would have made Primaris themselves less of an issue overall, because they're just upgraded Marines. Instead, we get this convoluted and overly complicated set of events presented to us. So in nearly every example, except, say, Calgar, which is a character that has already been retconned and boned over because they had him primarist up, and then for some reason, popping up at Vigilus on the opposite side of the galaxy, even though he was commanding the defence of Ultramar, and Guy Haley makes no mention of him being primarist in Dark Imperium or Plague War. But anyways, in most cases, when a named character is upgraded, it's because they are so badly wounded that even getting put in a Dreadnought wouldn't save them. But for some reason, even though they are super wounded, they go through this magical process and they are healed, and better than ever. Now, straight away, that doesn't make sense in and of itself, but we can allow it, I guess. But it kind of takes away from the whole issue of it being dangerous, because even if they say that, it seems to work when it needs to, in the law and for every named character that's got a book and a model already associated with it and like a fan base or whatever. Fine, fine, whatever, you might say. You are getting hung up on this. But not only does this feel lame, weak, and unnecessarily convoluted way of frankly just releasing bigger Space Marine models and updating the range, what does this mean for Dreadnoughts? You know, Dreadnoughts, one of the coolest and most terrifying things in the law. I mean, why not crack their sarcophagi open and Rubicon them? Seems overly cruel not to. I mean, seriously, why not? This fucking process extends bones and all that. Why can't it just grow limbs or maybe give them cybernetics and upgrade the rest? If it can heal and upgrade someone so wounded that they wouldn't survive dreadnoughting, then why not just use this magic? Why not just do it to the Emperor? No answer, I see. Well, whatever, I guess. I suppose sticking to the laws of a universe don't fucking matter. It's worked out really well for Star Wars. Why not just have webway gates in the Imperial Palace and orcs teleporting moons next to Terra itself and not attacking? Or orcish diplomats? Or let's have Ragnar Blackmane, 
who has no real connection to Gazgul Thraka, fight him in a duel and cut his head off, but not actually kill him, which not only diminishes and makes Gazgul seem weak, the best and basically only good Gaul character, and one of the biggest threats to the galaxy, but also is stupid, because he could have just wounded him, but now the stupid fucker has to have stitches on his neck going forward. And what about... Oh. Oh. Wait. I don't know who runs the law department or law development or whatever the section is at GW that does all this stuff. But I mean, please, please go read some like history or philosophy. Even reading like Lord of the Rings would be great and may inspire you. Just a little consistency and sense. Please, just stop hurting me so. Alright, sorry about that. I got it out of my system now. No more Primaris talk. They are just space marines to me now. And I'm going to ignore the whole issue going forward. I'm done. Except for this bit. So Mephiston is getting Primaris, and I suppose the story justifies this by saying he is dying. It just seems dangerous to me to try it out on him. Because, you know, warp stuff. But they do, and I've got to admit, the author does a good job of showing the process. He is skinned, he has organs inserted, he has a metal frame inserted onto him, etc, etc. All the extra bits Primaris have. And spoilers, it does work. But it only works because he dies and his spirit is joined to or merged with the Black Knight, which, as I've mentioned, appears to be the warp manifestation of the darkness in the blood. Get it? That all blood angels feel. The rage, the bloodlust, the darkness, as opposed to the more noble qualities of the Sons of Sanguinius, represented by the Sanguinor, which is a golden angel. Now I'm not going to wax all theological, but I like this scene where Mephiston speaks with what must be taken as Sanguinius, but it is also not him, but more an entity which is born in the warp from the souls, beliefs and emotions of all the blood angels and their successors, but also the masses of the Imperium who worship and pray to the great angel, as he is a major and perhaps most important figure in Imperial religion after the Emperor. I'll give you a taste of this interaction now. The rage seeks an outlet, said the bloody angel. It needs an avatar. It will find its way into you whether you choose to live or choose to die. If your soul remains here, your body will play host to all the fury of the floor, and it will strike down all you care for. Raculus, Antros, Dante... All the rest will go to their deaths, knowing that you betrayed them, and that the darkness was always in you. You will become the agent of the rage. You will destroy the bloodline of Sanguinius. Mephiston was soaring over the battlefield, if such a slaughterhouse could be named so, casting bolts of red light from his unsheathed sword. Mephiston lowered his head. Then I have no choice. You torment me. There is always choice. There never is. Fate demands we choose. Fate gives us no choices. You reveal the worst in me, Mephiston snarled. Your choice is a lie. You know what I will choose, and you will know my concern for my honour is what made me take it. You know I care more about that than about the fate of the blood. That... Is your lie. Think again. My friends, Mephiston said. His face hardened. No, I have none. Not Gaius Reckless, not Albinus. Then why do you care? Let your soul be free. I make my choice. Mephiston looked up defiantly at the bloody angel. Who are you? He asked again. I am what I am said the figure. You are the red angel I saw in the realm of the Lord of Blood. You are the harbinger of our doom, he said. I am that, and much more. The bloody angel swelled to enormous size, so that it dwarfed Mephiston, yet still retained the shape of a man. The helm receded, revealing a face of unsurpassed beauty, 
Gold crept over the red. Blonde hair, much like Mephiston's own, blew out in the wind. A titan was revealed, a lord of men, and yet he was human. All the sorrows of the world were expressed by his eyes. With a sharp snap, great white wings opened behind him, washing scented air over the lord of death. A terrible understanding smote Mephiston's hearts. He knew then he had failed an important test. Sanguinius! My father, I did not know, I did not know! He fell to his knees. Failure is not an option for any of us, said the angel. How? It is not possible, said Mephiston. He started to weep. Emotions he had not felt since before he was Callisterius swamped him. This is not real. You cannot be him. It is not real, agreed the figure. The warp is in turmoil. Things that were not possible before the rift are possible now. The Warmaster Abaddon played a desperate gambit. He has unleashed forces that he can never control. The warp itself is not evil. Always remember that, Mephiston. It is corrupted, but it contains everything. And that includes good, as well as evil. It includes you. Behind the white wings, the figures in the sky shrank. Still fighting, they descended from the heavens, in the process becoming no bigger than children, then smaller. As they diminished, so the image of Sanguinius grew, becoming a true giant, and a fearful halo blazed around his head, until the angels came to a halt either side of the vision, gold to the right and black to the left. Only then did the titanic angel cease to grow, and the angels let their swords hang by their sides. They looked blankly down on Mephiston. My lord Sanguinius, I am sorry. The vision of the Primarch smiled sadly down upon him. The angels blurred, they faded, and the last spectres of them were drawn within the Primarch's being. I am not Sanguinius. Sanguinius is dead, said the thing that wore the Primarch's face. It smiled sorrowfully at the Lord of Death then collapsed suddenly into a tsunami of blood that crashed down with the force of a falling mountain, drowning Mephiston in rich vitae. Upon its hot wave, he was carried thence out of the warp and back into the realm of the living. Good stuff, right? I like it. I'm not sure how much of this has been covered in the Mephiston series or... The Psychic Awakening book, which the new model accompanied, to be honest. I never read them. But it seems Mephiston has a whole of a sort of story arc that I'm not fully up on. Anyway, now Mephiston is super powerful. Dante tells him he will kill him if he becomes a threat in the future. But everything is cool now. So that's when we get back to the gene stealer infection from the start. The governor's heir asks for aid and Dante agrees because he is planning a blitzkrieging across the Red Scar to smash the high fleets there and reclaim the territory for the Imperium. But that relies upon getting the Nids to fall into his traps in space, I mean. This gene stealer takeover is dangerous because the Nids will hear it in the warp and instead of wandering around confused like they are at the moment following the defeat at Baal, they will head towards this core and ruin all Dante's plans. So the book ends in a fight against some Gene Stealer cultists, which is fun and bloody and has some cool moments, and we see Mephiston annihilating everything, which is good stuff again. Oh, and the old captain gets murdered by his lieutenant because he doesn't think he has gotten over his issues and can't be trusted to lead the fleet. So again, kind of makes the whole thing pointless unless this... Second in command is going to be a major character going forward. But I guess it was an excuse and a way of telling Dante's backstory more than anything. So what do we get from the book? Lots of backstory to Dante and details we didn't get before on his rise and who he is. Blood Angels Primaris aren't immune to the Black Rage. Mephiston is Primaris and we get to see the procedure and also is now possessed by, I guess you would say, a demon, but a kind of good demon? Of mankind? Kind of? Dante is planning the reconquest of the Imperium Nihilus. Oh, and it seems at the end that the Blood Angels aren't sticking to the limitations of the Codex on numbers anymore and are just churning out hundreds of new recruits. 
which seems fine given the circumstances, but I would like some other organs of the Imperial State to question this and say, eh, is that a good idea? Baal is also being built up, literally, into a mini-me Imperial Palace Fortress World capital, and efforts are being made to reunite and gain control over all the disputed and broken parts of that side of the galaxy. Overall, a good book, but my issue is... Nothing that happens in it is groundbreaking or progresses the overall storyline. I mean, yes, we learn that Dante is planning to break the Tyranids nearby, finally, as a precursor to, I guess, a mini Great Crusade to reclaim that half of the galaxy, the Nihilist half. But he is just planning it. Other than that, nothing much happens. So, yeah, very much feels like the middle book of a series builds on characters we have, sets things up for the next book, which I'm looking forward to, don't get me wrong, but just left me feeling a bit meh. Comparing it to Devastation, which is a 10, just in everything, action, events, characters, everything, this felt like a, a 7 at best, and that's only because it's a follow-on from Devastation for the most part. And that's just because it feels, I don't know, a bit thinner, a bit like filler. Definitely not bad in any way just not much happening in it and a lot of b stories with no real main a storyline to follow still good would definitely recommend just don't expect to feel the same as you did about devastation of baal there's also some other bits and bobs in there with side characters for instance we get a really good scene but it's just a sort of one-off it's a short story basically of a primaris marine uh, being hunted by uh, gene stealers in a spaceship, in an abandoned spaceship. I mean, that's good moments. There's other bits for, throughout, you know. Okay, lads, I'll wrap it up there. I hope this wasn't too dull for you. I tried to be honest, and I mean it on the Primaris thing. They aren't going away, and I'm bored of speaking about them now. I would defo pick this up. It's still better than a lot of the stuff GW put out lately, even if a little, not dull, just not really exciting. And it does have a lot of good stuff that holds the attention and uh, really adds to the backstory and starts to make sense of it. Plus, Guy Haley is blatantly playing with us, which is uh, which is a nice touch. <laughs> Thanks for everyone supporting the channel. You can see your names here. If you would like to join the production crew, the honour list here, which greatly helps me, lads, I really appreciate it, then please consider supporting me on Patreon or Subscribestar by following the links below, or as a YouTube member, by clicking that, that nice big join button right below the screen there. You know that one there? You can hover your mouse over it. Really easy to click. Thanks again. See you next time with the uh, Lion L. Johnson Primark novel, which I am reading right now. Been a bit slow with my reading the last couple of months, but back on it now, so expect more rambling reviews coming soon. See you later, everybody. Cheers.